Well, I guess it's good afternoon now, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm sensing a little interest in IOL calculations. What do you think? Um, my name is Doug Koch, and I'm uh, delighted to be here to moderate this session sponsored by Hogstrite on new advances and new solutions for IOL calculations. And we have a fantastic group of speakers and panelists. Um, so uh, Warren Hill, Mike Snyder, Steve Scoper, and Adi Abalafia, uh, each of whom um, has done important work to advance what we're doing. Uh, so I think without further ado, I'd like to first begin with uh, Warren Hill. I think, as you know, uh, Warren has developed uh, the Hill RBF formula coming from a completely different direction and uh, offering something that I think has been a huge contribution to our clinical practice. And Warren is going to talk to us about the formula, how it evolved, and give us a little more feeling of, of not only what it can do now, but because of its sort of self-validating and its also a, ability to be expanded where it can take us in the future. So, Warren. Thank you, Doug, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Wow, it's, uh, it used to be that uh, talking about lens power calculations during lunch was like a death sentence. And uh, it's, it's amazing how all of us have grown to see uh, cataract surgery and lens-based surgery in entirely uh, almost as a, in, a refractive procedure now, and um, the number of you in the room uh, represents that. Okay, so this is a brand new method, as Doug mentioned, for doing IOL power calculations. And um, it doesn't use virgin's formulas. It's coming at the problem from a completely different point of view. And as such, it's not encumbered by some of the problems that we've had in the past. Now, most importantly, this is a worldwide collaborative effort. This is not the work of one person. This has been a joint project with Hogstrite over the last seven years. In fact, everybody at this podium has been involved in the, the evolution of this project. This is 27 surgeons in 14 countries in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, North and South America, Asia, India, and Australia. So again, it's a worldwide collaborative effort, and as Doug mentioned, it's constantly expanding and constantly evolving. Now, whenever we do something new, everybody wants to know, you know, what did you do and how do you do it? But I think more importantly is why did we do this? And I think all of us in this room are committed to increasing patient safety and physician confidence and reducing the burdens associated with a refractive surprise. Now, how we did this was we successfully borrowed and adapted two um, aspects of an already well-established calculation method within the engineering community and applied it to ophthalmology. There are often not a lot of original ideas, but there are original applications to how we can do things. And what we came up with was a self-validating continuously improving IOL power selection method that's free of virgin's formulas and the limitations of the effective lens position. Now, whenever we go in the operating room, that elephant in the room that's with us is IOL power selection. This always plays in the background, and it isn't until that second or third visit that we get an idea of how well did we do at this, at this process. So what's the typical half-diopter accuracy for us as surgeons? And if you look at four well-known studies, uh, the Hahn study, um, the Glenn Gale study for the National Health Service in the United Kingdom, the Swedish Registry study, and the Haggis Formula Optimization study, you see basically that nobody's getting it right all the time. The Haggis Formula Optimization study um, that I oversaw is, a, is more than a quarter million cases, and even after the removal of outliers and the optimization of lens constants, half-diopter accuracy is still about 78%. So this is the gap that we need to close. And if we drill down deeper in this very large database, less than 1% of surgeons are at 92% or better. 6% of surgeons are at 84%, and the vast majority of people are at 78. I have some good news for all of you today. We can move almost everybody in this group up to that first column with a couple of changes in how you do things. So this is huge. This is what 78% accuracy looks like represented graphically. And so we need to do better if we're going to be putting in multifocals and torics. The calculation methods that we use right now are basically virgin's formulas. And we all have our, our favorite way of doing things, maybe depending on axial length. There's still some people using SRK2. The majority of us are using virgin's formulas. There's uh, ray tracing with uh, Thomas Olson's formula. And then, of course, there's this new method based on artificial intelligence. This is from an ASCRS survey, and you can see that the majority of surgeons choose a formula based on axial length. 
here's the formula you're using. This is from uh, Frederick Gauss from 1840. It's the first half of the 19th century. And if we fast forward to right now, you'll see that this formula and this formula, which is the mathematical backbone for all the virgin's formulas, are very much the same. We've added the effective lens position, keratometry, a few other things, vertex distance, but pretty much we're still using a virgin's formula from the first half of the 19th century. Now, the interesting thing is the power of the intraocular lens inside the eye is relative, not absolute. So a 21 diopter lens inside the eye is only 21 diopters, a set distance from the cornea, and that we call the effective lens position. If that lens moves posterior or anterior or set another way, if the anatomy of the eye and the assumptions of the formula are different, what we get is a refractive surprise. So a lot of people would think, well, if I have a shallow anterior chamber, the lens is going to sit more anterior. Well, here's a, here's a plot of anterior chamber depth against axial length. And we're going to take a look at the effective lens position at a schematic eye parameter, 23 and a half millimeters. I had absolutely no trouble finding 40 eyes where the effective lens position didn't correlate with the preoperative anterior chamber depth in any way whatsoever. It, they, these were all 5.5 millimeters. So, our ability to correctly determine the effective lens position, which also determines the total optical power of the eye, you know, has a lot of limitations. And one of the purposes of this, this approach was to get rid of that limitation. So here's the database on the RBF method that we're currently using. There's the half diopter accuracy. This is SRKT. These are all the cases that are outside half diopter accuracy for about 3,400 cases. Here's that same database, and here's half diopter accuracy, and these are the cases that are outside half diopter accuracy with this new method, and I'll show you how we did that. So how comfortable are we with making change? You know, we as surgeons, we're very, very reluctant to change for fear we're going to experience something unanticipated. And for us to dump something that we've used for 40 years and, and, place, and replace it with something else requires that several criteria be fulfilled. It has to have an advantage. It has to be compatible with what we knew and what, what we know and what we do. It has to not be so complex that we can't use it. And we have to be able to trial it and make sure that it lives up to its promises. And we have to observe these improvements in a way that we believe them and we can incorporate them. This is an example of a game-changing technology. When the iPhone first came out, I thought it was the stupidest idea I've ever heard of. Why would a computer company make a telephone? I mean, I, have, I had a Nokia phone. I thought it was great. What does Apple know about this? Well, they weren't making a phone. They were making something different. And it was a completely different idea. And my father used to say that the, the, there's nothing more powerful than a good idea. And that's what I think we have right now. So looking at different groups who are willing to change what they're doing, a man named Everett Rogers wrote a book called The Diffusion of Innovations. And if you don't know his book, you know his vocabulary because we use it every day in our conversations. What Everett Rogers says is that within any group of, of people looking to adopt a technology, there are different subsets. And any one of us can be in any one of these groups depending on the technology and where we are in our thinking. So they're the early adapters, the people that stand in line eight hours to get an iPhone because they want to have it and they believe in it. There's the early majority, people who try it only after someone else tries it. There's the late majority, people who are kind of inherently cynical and follow established norms, kind of like that uh, approval nurse for the HMO that you're working with that can't spell vitrectomy. And um, they're the laggards. These are the people that have an iPhone only because rotary phones aren't available. And then there are the innovators, the people like Doug Koch, that, that show us you know, what's possible and new ways of thinking. More broadly based, those people to the left are looking to enhance outcomes. And those people on the other side are looking to maintain familiarity. And my hope is that every person in this room is looking to enhance outcomes. So we're going to talk about pattern recognition and artificial intelligence, totally different than anything we've ever used in ophthalmology before. And the, the advantage of uh, pattern recognition is it's adaptive learning. So what, we, what we're using is based on data only, independent of what was previously known. A lot of the formulas we have uh, limit situations to possibilities that we already understand. And this is self-organizing, which means it has its own ability to create its own representation of the data. And it's well suited to the task of unraveling complex 
nonlinear relationships. Think about the human eye. For an axial length of 26.5 millimeters, how many combinations of central corneal power, anterior chamber depth, lens thickness, and white to white are there? It's unbelievable. That's 26.5. Now to go to, to 26.5. Five, five, how many combinations are there? It's an astronomical number. So we have a way of de dealing with this that's different than what we have before. And this is free of calculation bias. So let's, let's do a little exercise in pattern recognition. Think about how little information you have here on the screen, and yet each of us are able to figure out exactly what these represents. This is a form of pattern recognition. We can take that same simple idea and look at it differently with preoperative measurements and postoperative results, and we can turn this into a pattern. And with the scary fast computers we have and the very sophisticated software we have, we can turn these patterns into an IOL power. So here's another example. This is a, a square. It's got a 1,000 random input vectors. And these vectors were generated by something called the Manhattan Distance Generator. The Manhattan Distance is the uh, the sum of absolute sum of Cartesian coordinates, they end up looking like little squares, like the city blocks of Manhattan. And we're going to ask an artificial intelligence algorithm to tell us the internal organization of this seemingly chaotic uh, picture. We're going to use a tool called feature extraction and feature matching, and we're going to run it through 5,000 times. And with the computers we have, this doesn't take very long. So here's 40 cycles, 120 cycles, 500 cycles and 5,000 cycles, and from this seeming chaotic mess, we were able to tell that these were Manhattan distances. So think how powerful this technology is for IOL power calculations, and you can see why we're excited about it. So you might think, well, this is pretty geeky. No one's ever heard of this before. Turns out that all of you with an iPhone in your pocket are using this right now. It's all around us. So when oil companies want to figure out how much oil they're going to get out of the ground, they use this technology. Uh, tractor companies, motorcycle companies, um, automobile manufacturers use this to calibrate their engines. When law enforcement wants to find the bad guy by facial recognition, they use, they use this technology. And tens of billions of dollars are moved around the world every day in the stock market using the pattern recognition form that, we, that we're employing here um, for predicting what the stock market's going to do. You can also use this for um, get, getting rid of noise. And EKGs, or, or rather thumbprints and fingerprints, are using this for identification. So if you have an iPhone, you have an, your American Express card um, on your iPhone, it asks you for your fingerprint. That's where this is coming from. And EKGs are now using this. And EKG is what? It's just a pattern. And you remember, as medical students, when you were asked to figure out that crazy arrhythmia torsades de points or something unusual, you know, we had to ask our attending, you know, what that was. Now we just run it through um, a pattern recognition algorithm in the EKG machine, and it can pick up and tell us exactly what the arrhythmias are. This is, this is called T-wave alternans, and if this shows up, these patients get pacemakers and defibrillators. So we develop a calculator basically by figuring out what things are most important. We know that axial length is important, central corneal power, anterior chamber depth. But who knows? Maybe the patient's zodiac sign, mother's maiden name, favorite dessert, shoe size, you know, may come into it. So we, we, we use a genetic algorithm. It's a form of, of evolutionary model uh, development to allow us to pick out the factors that are most important. And because this isn't an, uh, a formula, things pop up that we may not expect, like the patient's age or their pre-op spherical equivalent. What we were looking for is the greatest number of cases within half a diopter for the data we use to fit the database, to fit the model, and then also an independent validation set. And we, we found that the axial length, central corner power, and anterior chamber depth for a given IOL power and postoperative results was the best for us and then also the fewest out-of-bounds points. And I'm going to go over that in just a minute and show how this is a brand new tool in ophthalmology and how it helps us to make a lot of decisions. Now, this is where things begin to get interesting. If you look at this, this is about 650 cases. We've taken a cloud of data and turned it into a straight line. This is our half diopter accuracy. And you can see that there's no calculation bias. The number of out-of-bounds points clusters only with number of cases, not axial length. So this is the first time we have something where it doesn't really matter what the axial length is. Now, remember, the, the, the goal of all of us up here is patient safety and physician confidence. 
and this is one of the new tools that we're bringing to iWell Power Calculations that's going to make things easier for all of us. In engineering, there's a concept called a boundary model, and a boundary model is a way of taking look, a look at pairs of data and determining what the accuracy is going to be before the calculation is done. And this is axial length against central corneal power. And mathematically, we can set these boundary models to whatever we want. This is for 90% accuracy with half a diopter. We can identify those data points that are outside the boundary model and flag the user. So for those of, us, those of you who've used this before, that's that out of bounds statement. So this is the, these are the six pairwise boundary models for the RBF version that you're currently using either on your LENSTAR or on the online calculator. And um, this is for 3,445 eyes. And if we do a calculation for Plano with a 26 millimeter axial length, there's that data point within that pairwise boundary model. We can add the Ks, and there are those, those um, points within those boundary models, and we can add the anterior chamber depth. And you can see that every single one of these data point, points are within the confines of a 90% accuracy pairwise boundary model. It's an inbounds calculation. So this, what, this is what it means when you get that statement. In a similar way, we're going to take the same eye, but this time we're going to have a scary shallow anterior chamber of 1.5 millimeters. Now for 26 millimeter eye, I don't have any data for a 1.5 millimeter anterior chamber depth, and you can see that some of these orange dots are outside the boundary model. It means we don't have data to support the calculation, don't use it, and that's what the out of bounds indication means. So for most regression algorithms, you're working in two dimensions. Here we're working in six. So it's a completely different approach. There's a calculator online that many of you are familiar with. This is what it looks like. If you want to read about what it is, you can hit what is this, and it'll explain it to you. And if you're as geeky as a lot of us, you can kick on this, and, and it'll take you to all the scary math, and it'll explain exactly what we're doing. You can enter the calculator, and it'll take you to something that looks just like what's on the LENSTAR. And through an enormous act of generosity, Hogstride has made this available not only for the LENSTAR, but also for other biometry methods as well. Right now, we're sampling the artificial intelligence model at Plano. The next version, you're going to be able to actually enter your de desired spherical equivalent because we're going to have more data, and Steve Sco Scoper is going to talk about that in just a minute. Right now, we're calculating for Plano, and we'll give you a one diopter range. The next version is going to be quite different. So this is an inbounds calculation, and this is an out-of-bounds calculation for the same IOL power because some of the preoperative measurements may be different. Now, again, we're very slow to change as uh, ophthalmologists, but in the first 30 weeks, we had more than 75,000 calculations just for the online calculator, and we're anticipating more than 130,000 calculations for the online calculator in the first year. This is what it looks like on the LENSTAR. So we have RBF, we have Barrett, and we have Olson, the three formulas that are from this century, and also formulas that have the highest amount of accuracy. Now the fun part is they're continuing updates, and this is where we are right now. We've just finished this update. Our 27 beta testers in 14 countries have sent us 12,419 cases, and you can see we have a tremendous range. In fact, we're now going down to minus five diopters and up to 30 as well. But this is sort of a, a huge range of uh, human, human anatomy here. And what I want to share with you is something that I've never seen before, and this is one of the most exciting parts about what we're doing. Um, if you look at the, this entire database and we fit it to the artificial intelligence model for the half diopter accuracy, we had no out-of-bounds cases. We were able to reproduce the outcomes for more than 12,000 cases. And the ability of the artificial intelligence model to fit this database was 98%. Now, we haven't done a prospective test on this. Steve Scoper is going to show us what the accuracy is like. He's the first person to use this, this new version. But this is very, very exciting. So this is where we are in, uh, in August of 2017, and this is where, gonna, where we're going to be in August of 2018. So as Doug Koch mentioned, this is continuously evolving, and um, it's very, very exciting. This next version is going to be based on 12,000 cases. Hopefully the version after that will be based on 30,000 cases. That's our goal. So 
every time we do this, we're going to expand the boundary model. And that's the goal of this, is to make the boundary model bigger and better and have a greater uh, breadth and depth for your calculations. So in my opinion, the calculation, the future of Iowa power calculations is very bright. And this is an exciting time to be an ophthalmologist because now we have the ability to be accurate in a way we couldn't be before. So this is how we started out, 78%. This is where we're going to be with the next version. And the goal of this project is nothing less than to remove the uncertainty for the calculation of the spherical equivalent for all of us. So wouldn't that be something great if you never had to have that elephant in the room come with you when we did IOL power calculations? Thank you.